All right, good morning, community. How we doing? Good, good, good. And I want to say uh, also good morning to our digital, our growing digital audience that are joining us uh, online. It's good to have them as well. Um, today is a big day in the life of community. And if you're a newcomer here, you picked a great day to join us. And here's why. Because at the end of my talk, um, I'm going to give the opportunity for those people who call community their church home uh, to really demonstrate, you're going to see it firsthand, how much they love other people, both in this community and around uh, the world. Um, it is our Breakthrough Sunday, and we're going to get a chance to come forward at the end and give our kind of one-time gift. It's going to go to some of these causes, but also what we're going to give above and beyond our normal giving to help people, both locally and globally, find their way back to God. And here, here's some good news. Um, our staff and some of our leaders have kind of gone first and actually made commitments already to Breakthrough, and you'll be encouraged to know that those commitments are now nearly $2 million. So that's, that's remarkable. That's good stuff. Hope that encourages you. Um, but here's the thing, too. I want you to get this. The important number is not $2 million. The important number is not $7 million. The real important number, I'd say, is 100. I would love to see 100% of folks that are part of a community that call this their church home say, you know what? I want to be a part of this. Because I'm telling you, being a part of something like this, it adds significance to your life, which is really kind of where we're headed and I'm going to talk about just a little bit. But before we do, let me say one more thing. Um, I hope everybody got one of these uh, commitment card envelopes when you came in. If you didn't get one of those, just raise your hand. Yeah, if you want to participate in this, raise your hand so you can make sure we get one. The ushers will make sure you get one. We've got a couple folks down here. All right. And just a real quick before I jump into my talk, here's how this kind of works. Uh, we have a, your one-time gift for today. Whether you're giving that in cash or check or you're going to give it online, you write that right in there, that amount. The video we just heard is all about the great four teams of Celebration Generosity, which we all love. Uh, Breakthrough is going to give the first 10% of our commitments to that. We really pray and anticipate that could be the largest uh, amount we've ever given to Celebration Generosity. And then the last line here is what you're going to give above and beyond your normal giving. So it's above and beyond your normal giving over the next three years. You tally it up, and that gives you your total, and you'll get a chance to uh, come forward at the end and uh, do that along with me. All right? Good? Okay, I'll tell you what. I would say that maybe um, the most um, riveting film, one of the most riveting films I've seen this year is Free Solo. Um, anybody? This, this is, abs I mean, it is, okay, if you, it is absolutely stunning. And, and I don't think it's even hyperbole. So it's almost mind-blowing. Free Solo is this amazing documentary about a professional rock, rock climber named Alex Honnold who attempts to be the first person to conquer a free solo climb of the famed El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. And I think we got a picture of the, uh, and I'm telling you, that doesn't even do it justice, all right? I'm telling you, it is an intimidating uh, presence. Honnold attempts to climb this free solo. Now, if you don't know what that means, free solo, I'm not a rock climber, I do other things, but I'm not a rock climber. Free solo means this, it means he's gonna climb this thing with no ropes, no harnesses, no carabiners, no help from anybody. Just him, his hands, his feet. He's going to climb this thing. Now, some people look at this and go like, that's reckless, it's senseless. But I'm telling you, after watching this, this guy is fearless. He is fearless. Here's the deal. In the last 100 years, 121 people have tried to climb El Capitan with ropes, with harnesses, with the help of other people. 31 of them have died. Nobody's ever tried to do it free solo. And that's what he sets out to do. And then on top of this, check this out. On top of this, then he has his friends, he wants his friends to actually come and videotape the whole thing, video the whole thing, because he wants to create a documentary. And they're kind of like, you know what, no, we don't really, we don't, don't make us do it, we don't want to see you fall to your death. Let me see again, I'm just curious, how many of you, how many of you have seen this? How many of you have seen this thing? Okay, there's, there's a smattering of them. Okay, for those of you who haven't seen it, to give you just kind of a taste of this, okay, here's just a, you know, 40-second glimpse. Here we go. Does it feel different to be up there without a rope? It's obviously, like, much higher consequence. People who know a little bit about climbing, they're like, oh, he's totally safe. And then people who really know exactly what he's doing are freaked out. I've always been conflicted about shooting a film about free soloing just because it's so dangerous. It's hard 
to not imagine your friend falling through the frame to his death. Is that wild or what? I mean, the whole thing, I mean, it's, I mean, it's like that, the, it's just riveting, riveting. Okay, there's, there's a couple things I took away after watching this documentary. Okay, one that struck me, this guy is absolutely just, he's fearless, just fearless. But then there was a second thing. And as you hear the doc, as you go to the documentary and listen to him talk, there is absolute clarity for him about what he's willing to trade his life for. And he, there's just no, he's, he's clear about it. Climbing El Capitan is the most important thing in his life. It's more important than life. If he dies, he dies. And in fact, here's, here's one of the things he said. He said this. He said, each day there's a chance you might die. Then he goes on, there's nothing wrong with that. Every living being on earth is facing that same existential rift. And for him, he's just made the decision that he is willing to die trying this. And consequently, because of that, he's just not afraid. He knows exactly what he's willing to trade his life for. And here's what's interesting, and I kind of picked this up. Once you know exactly what you'll trade your life for, it's like the fear, or maybe better said, the fear of fear kind of starts to dissipate. And, and, and every decision just because that you have to make about certain things, big things, just becomes obvious. I think perhaps the biggest difference between like Alex Honnold and most of us is that he knows exactly what he wants to live and die for. And I think a lot of us, we never quite get clear about that. We never quite get clear about that. And, and here's the truth, here's the truth that I'm coming to grips with. And it's this, we all, all of us, trade our life for something. We all trade our lives for something. Either we trade our lives all at once, like maybe Honnold might do, or we trade it one day at a time over the course of 79 years for something, whatever we get back in exchange. And for some of us, we, tr we trade our lives to accumulate as much money as we possibly can. Some of us trade our lives trying to get the love and acceptance from just a handful of people. We spend our whole life trying to get that. Some, some of us, we live our 79 years and we exchange it for two or three major accomplishments. But for many of us, we actually never get quite clear. We never get clarity about what we live for or what we die for. And it, and it was the late, great Martin Luther King Jr. He understood the importance of this. And, and, he, and here's what he said. He said this, if you haven't found something you're willing to die for, you aren't fit to live. If you haven't found something you're willing to die for, you aren't fit to live. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't say this movie's really spiritual, but it felt like, this documentary almost felt like a spiritual experience for me because at the end of it, I was left with this question. Dave, what are you willing to trade your life for? Hey Dave, what are you willing to trade your life for? And I'm glad you're here with us this morning because I don't, I'm not sure there's a more important question. So, so let me ask you the same question I'm asking myself, and it's this. What are you trading your life for? If it was over right now, or if it ends at 79 years, average life expectancy in the U.S., what did you trade your life for? And I think it's one of the most profound questions we can ask ourselves, because here's the deal. Once we get clear about the answer to that question, it is like, I think, fear begins to disappear and everything else in our life just becomes obvious. Now, during this series called Breakthrough, we've been, it's, been, it's been terrific, I, I've loved it personally. We've been going through the book of Acts. We've been going through the book of Acts and we're learning how God's at work in the lives of the early Christ followers and we've seen some amazing breakthroughs. Some breakthroughs in individuals, some breakthroughs in whole groups of people in churches. One of the guys who has one of the most remarkable breakthroughs in the whole book of Acts is a guy by the name of Paul. Now, Paul is this guy who outwardly seems very secure and, and, and very accomplished. In fact, here, here's how he describes himself. He says, if someone thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I got more. <laughs> kind of a cocky guy, right? And then he goes through his resume. 
circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Faultless. And basically, he goes through the whole thing. You got a, you got a bachelor's degree? I got a master's degree. You went to COD? I went to Harvard. You were all conference? Guess what? I was all American. I mean, he just goes through the whole thing and just kind of like, no, 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 this is who I am. And so he sounds like this guy who's secure and successful, but he's actually, when he says this, okay, when he's saying this, this is actually during a period of his life when he was operating out of fear. Because before Paul ever met Jesus, okay, this movement of Jesus back in Jerusalem started to swell and started to grow, and we've been reading about that in Acts. And because it was growing and swelling, and he wasn't a part of it, he was part of the religious establishment, okay, it was, being, it was threatening to him. He's, he's worried that they're going to take his power. They're worried they're going to they're rob him of his treasured traditions, that, that they're going to take his place of influence. And so then, out of fear and out of anxiety, Paul begins persecuting this growing movement of Christ followers. Now, my hunch is that a lot of us in this room could probably relate to this idea of doing things out of fear. I know a little about what that's like. You know what that's like, too. I mean, where, where maybe on the outside people think you got it together, and, and maybe even people are, are, are complimenting you or praising you for success, but on the inside, you, you still feel afraid, and you find yourself, you find yourself making many decisions out of fear. That was Paul. But then Paul has this dramatic encounter with God. He's on his way to a city named Damascus, He's, gonna, he's going there, he's still operating out of fear, anxiety, and trepidation for this movement. He's going to persecute more followers. Paul, who at that point, his name is Saul, he meets Jesus, and he, got, and he has a, a breakthrough, a breakthrough. And I'm telling you, when you have a breakthrough with God, it is life-changing. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. Everything about his life changes in an instant. Because in that instant, he realized that Jesus was God. Now, just Again, go there with me. If Jesus is God, that means everything he say, has to say about how to live life, we ought to really pay attention to. And if everything he has to say about how this world ought to operate, we ought to be leaning into and getting on board with that mission. And that became very clear to Paul. Absolutely clear to Paul. Because he goes then from being one of the, most, one of the people who's persecuting followers of Jesus to being one of the most passionate spokespeople and advocates for the Jesus mission. So now with this transformation, Paul, he just gets tremendous clarity. This is the thing. This, this is the key leverage point. This is what I'm going to trade my life for. And, and, he, and he says this. Look at this in Philippians. In Philippians, he says this. For me, <laughs> for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Jesus and his mission is everything to Paul. He's going to live for Jesus. He's willing to die for Jesus. And once Paul gets clear about that, what he's going to trade his life for, it's like everything else that he was afraid of, anything, it's gone. He's not afraid of anything. And every other decision becomes crystal clear for him. Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking, going like, okay, well, how, how do I get to that point where I know what I'm willing to trade my life for? And I'll tell you, when you are singularly, singularly focused on something, when you are willing to push past fear, no matter the risk, no matter the challenge, that's something you're willing to trade your life for. Let, let me give you an example from the life of Paul, okay? Life of Paul. Um, we get over to, all the way to Acts 20, chapter 21. Paul's been gone from Jerusalem. He's gone on three different, what they call missionary journeys. He's planting churches in all over the known world. He's now going to come back to Jerusalem. He wants to come back to Jerusalem. And as he gets on his way back to Jerusalem, this prophet approaches him with a warning. And we pick it up here in Acts, in Acts chapter 21. It says this, Agabus came down from Judea, coming over to us. He took Paul's belt. Check this out. He takes Paul's belt, right, like literally almost off of him. He ties his own hands with Paul's belt and his feet with it. And then he says to Paul, okay, Paul, the Holy Spirit has told me in this way, okay, kind of hogtied here, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem are going to bind the owner of this belt, being you, and will hand you over to the Gentiles. Now, I'm not sure how your friends warn you about not going somewhere. That seems a little extreme. 
I mean, you could just send them a Yelp review and say, look, it's not that great of a place, you shouldn't go. That makes more sense. Um, but Paul's not having it, okay? And I think maybe, maybe this prophet thought that Paul was like, you know, a visual learner, so he's taking off his belt and he's tying him up. He's saying, this is what's gonna happen to you, Paul. And if I'm Paul, I'm probably, I'm, you know, jump on Travelocity, I'm gonna change my flight plans. No, not to Jerusalem, I'm headed to Italy or something nice, right? Well, here's what happens. Paul ignores it. His friends are telling him, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. Kind of like Alex Honnold's friends, right? Are saying, no, don't climb, don't climb this thing. Don't make us video <laughs> you doing this. But he's not backing off. Because Paul is crystal clear about what he's willing to trade his life for. And here, here, here's what he says in the next verse. Look at this. Paul answers, hey, why, why are you weeping? You're breaking my heart. I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul was so consumed with Jesus and his mission that he, he didn't care if this risk brought death. If I'm alive, it's all about Jesus. If I die, then better yet, I'm with Jesus. Those warnings wouldn't discourage him. The uncertainty of what was ahead wouldn't deter him. Fear would not stop him. He was willing to risk it all for Jesus and his mission. This guy's like fearless. Fearless. Um, I wanna go back to the Free Solo documentary, okay? Uh, about Alex Honnold. There was one more fascinating detail that I didn't mention. So Alex Honnold, he climbs, okay? He does. He free solos. El Capitan. Amazing. They filmed the documentary. And you can go home and you can watch it if you want. After this amazing accomplishment, a handful of scientists are curious about what it is, if anything, that was different about Alex's brain that allowed him to accomplish this extraordinary feat. So they ask him, they ask him, would you, will, will you allow us to do an MRI on your brain? He agrees. Here's what they found, okay? Check this out. The scan on the left, okay? The scan on the left, um, this, this, is, this is the brain of Alex Honnold, right? The scan over on the right is, the, is, the, is a brain scan of another uh, climber about the same age, and they showed both of them the picture of El Capitan. Okay, two different people both showed the picture, that intimidating picture of what it looks like to try to climb El Capitan. Now there's a part of the brain that receives information, and when that image, like of El Capitan, is, if, it's a, if it's a threatening or intimidating image, it triggers in the brain something that creates this emotion of fear. Now I want you to notice the scan on the right. The scan on the right, this part that's, growing, that's glowing yellow, you see this right here? This is the amygdala. Okay, and the amygdala is like the brain's fear center. And you notice it is a bright yellow because it's feeling fear. The average person, right, average rock climber, he's feeling fear. Here's Alex Honnold's brain. There's like nothing. There's no fear. It's like the guy, he's, he's looking at El Capitan and he's, it's like he's at home in his backyard laying in the hammock, right? He's feeling nothing at all. And what the scientists discovered about Alex's brain is simply that his brain does not respond like a normal person's brain. Which you guys knew 15 minutes ago, right? <laughs> he doesn't feel fear. He doesn't feel the fear the same way you and I would. There's something different about this guy. There's something different about him that allows him to actually do incredible things that would literally scare the rest of us to death. I want you to hang on to that because you know what? The Apostle Paul says there's something different about him and us too. That there's actually something different about followers of Jesus that empowers us to push back fear and uncertainty and move forward in faith in times when other people go like, no, I don't get it. Why would you do that? And in fact, that's something different. And what happens is when, when, when God breaks through into the life of a Christ follower, when God breaks through in the life of Christ follower, his spirit, right, God's spirit, you with me on this, actually comes to life inside of us. That's what happens for us. And then Paul describes it this way. He says this. He says, for God doesn't give you, what shows up inside of you is not a spirit of, what's the word right there? Oh, you gotta do a little louder. What's the word right there? Fear. That's right, not a spirit of fear or even of timidity, but instead what shows up inside of us when God comes to life, it's like, is a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. 
And so when God's Spirit actually breaks through into our life, He actually gives us the faith to move forward even in the face of fear. He makes us different than we were before, different than those who do not have the Spirit. And here's what I believe. I believe today that God wants to break through into our lives, break through into our church like never before, and make us fearless. I believe he wants to do through us things that have never been done before. Things, things that, that, that are the work and the power of his fearless spirit, both inside us, but then through us. And here's the way it works. When people pray, help me out. What happens? God breaks through. That's exactly right. He breaks through. And when he breaks through, really breaks through into our lives, okay, he invites us to fearlessly join in moving his mission forward. Here's what's kind of interesting to me. In many ways, um, this church, Community Christian Church, I don't think would be around if, if it wasn't for, uh, wasn't for this question. Uh, the question of, what are you willing to trade your life for? What are you willing to trade your life for? I remember I was, uh, it was my freshman year in college. I went up to college, and um, I didn't know for sure exactly what I'd do. I kind of... <laughs> I don't know, I, had, I was kind of enamored with politics for some reason. I thought maybe law, those, I, just a number of things. Kind of a typical freshman. There were a lot of different things out there, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But the one thing I definitely did not want to do, I definitely did not want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor, mostly, and it wasn't because I really, well, a couple of things. One is my dad was a pastor, and so I grew up in a church, and everybody's like, oh, you should be a pastor. Your dad's a pastor, right? And I just found that really, really annoying, okay? And I mean, let's, let's be honest. When you think about what a pastor, it kind of, at least to me, I love my dad, but being a pastor, it just didn't sound like that exciting, right? So I'm like, that just, I'm not doing that. But then, it was my freshman year in college, and it was, it was literally like um, right between first and second semester, the break there, where I started wrestling with this question. Hey, Dave, what are you going to trade your life for? What are you going to trade your life for? And the more I thought about it, too, the more, the more that it just kept coming back to me, man, the the key leverage point for making a difference in this world, really making a difference in this world, and then we I didn't have the language back then, but the way we talk about it now, is to help people find their way back to God. If I could help people find their way back to God, I'm telling you, that changes people's lives, that changes families, that can change communities. That, that okay, that is the foundation for really changing our world. Because when God breaks through, right, I mean, that's, what, that, that's the key thing. And then God kind of backdoored me, because I'm going like, that's what I trained my life for. And I'm going like, well, how do you do that? And God was like, hey, how about if you become a pastor? Like, ah. And so, and so that's when I, it was really was my freshman year. Going like, I think I'm going to start a church. I think I'm going to help start a church. And of course, then it went a little further. And we're like, well, not only do I want to start a church, if I want to start a church that starts churches, because if you're going to help people find their way back to God, why not just kind of leverage that thing and keep, keep scaling it, right? That's how you can make a really big difference. And I think it was this question. It was this question, that, and, and, and really where myself and my wife Sue and my brother John and a bunch of friends from college, we found the courage to move back to Chicago and start a church. And here's what happened. I think in the middle of that, I mean, just imagine a, a group of 20-year-olds, right? God gave us a spirit, not of fear, not of timidity, but of power and love. And I want you to know that's part of your heritage. You are a part of that church. You're a part of that church. And I would love for you to wrestle with that question. What are you going to trade your life for? And are you willing to let God really, his spirit really break through and give you that, that spirit, not of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline? And with his spirit, are you willing to push past things that keep other people from moving the mission forward? Past the fear. So more people can find their way back to God. People like Anna and Margaret. I want you to hear their story. My name is Anna Quilosi, I'm 13 years old, and I've been attending community for almost all my life. I'm originally from Russia. Um, I have a younger brother named Nikki. When we were little, we got put up for adoption. I was about three or four. We were like in a tall building, I remember, and a fire started to happen. And me and my brother were in the same room. I remember trying to like pick him up out of the crib. I couldn't reach because I was too short. And I heard someone say, open the window, open the window. And then I, I jumped out. The next thing I remember, well, I was in an orphanage. Our mom was pretty young. She was signing some papers of some sort. And then from then on, I didn't really see her again. 
We didn't really have someone to watch over us. Like there'd be the caretakers, but they'd hit, they'd hit you a lot. Little while later, these two people started seeing us. I, I felt really connected and close to even the first couple times we saw them. And they started visiting us more and more and more. Another guy named Sasha, he asked me, do you, do you want these two parents to be your mom and dad? And I said, da, which means yes in Russian. Once we came here and we started going to the yellow box, I, I definitely felt like this was, this was a great place. Going to Kid City and all that definitely put a smile on both me and my brother's face. And the more and more we talked about God, the more and more I realized it was more than just a miracle that me and my brother came here. There was something definitely planned out in all our lives. One of the first times I really, really felt a connection was got with God was our, my first blast. And I remember crying with all my friends and especially the last summer camp, just seeing all the people getting baptized, it really touched me. I remember I was helping my friend Liana write her testimony and she'd always say, you know, you should write your own testimony, you should get baptized. And that's when I started to cry and say, you know, I'm actually kind of thinking about it. And she started to cry. I wanted to get baptized because I wanted people to know that I believed in God and I remember hearing all the clapping and I was just like, <sighs> and I just felt like a whole entire big weight was just lifted off my whole entire body. This year, me and my mom have really gotten close and she talked to me a lot about her life and my dad's life and my brother's life. Her whole entire story was a breakthrough. Through a series of events, things started spiraling. I started getting depressed, and then I started drinking. I was diagnosed with end-stage liver failure, acute kidney failure, but the hospital couldn't do anything else for me, so they sent me to a nursing home. I was in a rehab for about four weeks. I was released. My friend, good friend Michelle invited me to Community Christian Church to check it out. I was finding my way back to God, joined a small group, joined the singles group, I wanted to be able to work, physically work, and mentally work again. I wanted to meet a man that would love me, that would care for me, and I could marry. And I wanted to become a mom. Two tax seasons later, I decided I'm gonna try it, so I sent a few letters out to some clients and started my tax practice back up. And on a Sunday morning, um, this man came in. I went up to him and asked his name. His name was Jim. In March, we were engaged. In the following October, we were married. About 25 years before, I had wanted to adopt. We got a phone call from an agent that got our paperwork, and she deals with Russia. We went in May of this year to meet them, and we brought our children home on November 2nd. When I hear the word breakthrough, I think of God breaking through someone's life and that person finding their way back to God. I know our church has been praying for a breakthrough and I've seen it happen in my life and in many, many people's lives. I know that God, He, he has something big planned out in all our lives and one day that breakthrough is just going to happen for all of us. I'll tell you what, I will trade my life for that. That's something, that's something worth trading my life for, those kind of stories. And uh, Margaret and Anna happen to be here with us, so thank you, Margaret and Anna, for sharing your story very much. <laughs> Am I right about that? I mean, isn't that, I mean, that, that's the stuff that makes your life count, doesn't it, when you get to be a part of something like that? I'll tell you, one of the awesome things about being a church that's been around for 30 years now, too, is we're not just helping people find their way back to God, but now we're getting to help, like, generations, generations of people find their way back to God. Um, in just a moment, um, we're going to give you a chance to stand and come forward uh, with your envelope to make your one-time gift and your, your three-year commitment to the Breakthrough Initiative. And let me also say, I mean, for some of you, call this your church home, and, and maybe you're, you're going like, oh, man, I, I forgot about this, I wasn't ready. Um, if that's the case, I'll tell you what, we believe that people pray and then God breaks through. So I'll tell you, you, you take that envelope home, you pray about it um, this afternoon. I mean, you can get online, you can make your commitment or you can stick it, it's a prepaid 
stamp envelope. You can stick it in the, envelope, stick it in the mail tomorrow. But I would, I would love for, again, like I said, 100% of the people call Community Christian Church to, to be a part of this breakthrough. And I'll tell you, for me, I think as soon as I talked about it at first, there was kind of like, oh man, what are we gonna do? How much are we gonna do? You know, got kids in college and all that kind of stuff. And once we kind of did, I think the Spirit pushed us past the fear. Um, I think it was Sue, and I'm always kind of up for this kind of stuff, and Sue's the one who's like, has a little more sense. <laughs> and, uh, and she says, you know what? As I thought of it, she said, I really wouldn't want to be a church that wasn't constantly advancing the mission. I really wouldn't want to be a part of a church that wasn't constantly advancing the mission. And so we've we decided over the next three years, we're gonna give more to community Christian than, than we ever have. And, and it comes back to this question, because helping people find their way back to God, that's what I want, that's what I want to trade my life for. That's what I want to trade my life for. Um, so our band's gonna come out, but before um, we do, we, we wanna give you some time to think and some time to pray. Then we're gonna have a chance to receive communion, also commit to breakthrough. Uh, but we want you to hear from the four teams because they want a chance, the four teams of celebration generosity, which we love, we want to give them a chance to express their thanks to each of you. Because of your generosity today through the Breakthrough Initiative, you'll help Community 412 mentor students and provide meals to those struggling through food insecurity and walk alongside men and women as they return home. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Because of your gift to Breakthrough today, we'll be able to plant more churches all over the world through our partnership with Compassion, which means that children in the poorest areas of the world We'll have access to nutrition, healthcare, education, and most importantly, the chance to know Jesus. Because of your gift today, you have a unique opportunity to partner with New Thing, to catalyze more church planting. And what we know about church planting is this, new people find their way back to God through new churches. And so the result of your partnership with us today means more new churches planted, more new networks started, more people trained to start those networks in countries all over the world. So will you partner with us today? Because of your gift today to Breakthrough, more families will find their own church home across the Philippines, more businesses will be started and will begin to pour back into their communities, and children who are living on the streets tonight will finally have a warm meal and a warm bed and a family to come home to. We're gonna have the opportunity for you to, uh, first of all, receive communion, and then also give uh, to the Jesus mission through the breakthrough. Uh, so in a moment, you can come forward as you're ready, and there's, uh, there's tables in the back. Back there, there's also tables set up here in the front where you can receive the bread and the cup, a reminder of the body and the blood of Christ and how God broke through into your life. And so as you take communion, just whenever you're ready, you can just take it on your own, all right? Just go ahead and take it on, on your own, and you can leave your breakthrough commitment uh, envelopes in the baskets that are right there by the communion trays. But this is an opportunity for us as a church to break through the lives of kids and students and people far from him, uh, to break through and make an impact in all the locations where God has allowed us to have a community church, and also to break through uh, by starting brand new churches in prisons and also underserved parts of Chicagoland area. And uh, so as the band leads us this song, as you're ready, you can come forward, uh, to receive communion, and also leave your breakthrough gifts on the table. You can do that now.